Dear learners, one more step and you will be able to embrace the full power of complex analysis. The only thing that prevents you from doing so is the lack of the knowledge of the theory of multivalued functions. For the first time, the theory of multivalued functions was addressed by a French mathematician, Augustin Louis Cachy, in his memoir on Calculus of Complex Numbers, published in 1846, where he introduced such concepts as branching and branch cards. In Germany, young Riemann was apparently unaware of Cachy's progress, and he rederived most of his results with less mathematical rigor, but with much deeper insights. In 1851, under the guidance of Karl Gauss, he published his thesis called On the Foundation of the Theory of a Function of Single Complex Variable, where he introduced the concept of what is now known as Riemann's surface. We will build our introduction in baby steps in the most elementary ways, but by the end of this week, you will master the technique of regular branch separation, you will have some experience with analytical continuation and even some Riemann surfaces. To give you an idea of how important the concept of a multivalued function is, let me show you some simple example. Consider the simplest multivalued function, the square root of x. From your junior school, you probably remember that it's a two-valued function. Square root of 4 is either negative 2 or 2. In high school, we resolved this two-value problem by the introduction of the concept of an arithmetic root. We just decided to call an arithmetic root a positive root. And in most cases, consider this the only possible value of the square root. And it worked surprisingly well. Even in the real calculus, the notion of the arithmetic root seems to be consistent. Whenever we encounter the square root, there was a silent agreement to understand it as a positive number. But things change drastically once we transcend the real axis and rise into a complex plane. So let's see how the square root is going to look like once a real positive number under x, say x0, moves into a complex plane. So the initial vector, x0, rotates by angle phi. So we have for our complex number z equals x0 times e to i phi. So how would you define the square root of this number? Well, the most natural way would be to define square root of z as square root of x0 times e to i phi by 2. This procedure is called an analytic continuation of the square root into a complex plane along a curve. As you see, it comprises three components. The initial point or reference point, x0, the contour, in our case a part of a circle, and the function itself, the square root. Once we've agreed to take an arithmetic value for the square root of a real positive number, we manage to ascribe a single value to the square root of z as we move along the contour. By making a pi rotation, we arrive at point negative x0. And the square root of negative x0 is equal to e to i pi by 2 times the square root of x0, which yields i square root of x0. But what if we want to get to the same point but along a different path, say slightly different curved in the upper complex semi-plane? Well, the change of the argument is the same, and it doesn't seem to depend on the shape of the contour, while the modulus or the final number is also well defined. So we arrive at the same value. So the analytic continuation along the path doesn't seem to depend on the shape of this path. But wait a little. What if we choose a completely different path, say a lower semicircle? Then, for point negative x0, we obtain a different representation. It's e to minus i pi times x0. So the square root of this point at this number is e to minus i pi by 2 times the square root of x0. So it's minus i times the square root of x0. It's a different value. So it seems that we have a problem. But things get even worse once we make a full counterclockwise rotation around the origin. So from point x0, we change to x0 times e to 2 pi i, arriving at the same point. But the square root will now flip its sign. It will become square root of x0 times e to pi i. So what shall we do? We tried it to avoid the double validness of our square root function, but instead this problem is just grinning at us. Let's try to figure out the origin of this problem. Well, it's almost clear. The culprit is the change of the argument of the number under the square root by 2 pi. 
Indeed, the difference between minus x node when approached from above and minus x node when approached from below is that in the first case we treated its argument as pi, while in the second case is negative pi, so the difference is 2 pi. The same holds for a full counterclockwise rotation. But before we go any further, let's make one more interesting observation. Suppose we make a two full counterclockwise rotation around the origin in the complex plane. We know that under the first rotation, the square root flips its sign. But after the second rotation, the total change of the argument of our x0 number will be 4 pi. So it will become x0 times e to 4 pi i. And the square root will become the square root of x0 times e to 2 pi i. So it returns to its original value. Obviously, this property doesn't depend on the reference point or initial point. We may choose any point in the complex plane, say z0, make the first rotation and the square root of z0 flips its sign and after the second rotation it returns to its original value. So like in real calculus, in complex analysis, the square root function is also double valued. But what shall we do? How can we cure this problem? Well, the solution proposed by Cauchy was crude but extremely effective. We just forbid full rotations. But how do we achieve this? Well, we modify the structure of the complex plane itself. We make a cut. And the origin of this cut should be the origin of the rotating complex number, while the endpoint should go to infinity. A cut is not necessarily a straight line, but at least in the beginning, for pedagogical reasons, we start with straight lines. A cut drawn to make a function single valued is called a branch cut. And now let's see what's going to happen with our beloved square root of z once we draw a branch cut, say, along the negative real semi-axis. And now we see that the analytical continuation along the upper and lower arcs not only lead to different answers, but also to different points. The analytic continuation along the upper arc leads to a point on the upper bank of the branch cut, while the one along the lower arc leads to a point on the lower bank of the branch cut. Now they are separated by the infinitely small distance inside the branch cut. To distinguish them, we introduce a special notation. The point on the upper bank of the branch cut will be denoted as x plus i0, while the point on the lower bank of the branch cut is going to be x minus i0. This way we see that f of x plus i0 is now equal to the square root of x times e to i pi, which yields square root of x times e to i pi by 2. While the f of x minus i0 is equal to the square root of x times e to minus i pi, which yields square root of x times e to minus i pi by 2. But wait a little, what about the strictly negative real numbers? Well, they are positioned right inside the branch cut, and the value of the square root function for this direction of the branch cut is ill-defined there. This is a gruesome reality of the theory of multivalued functions. But on the bright side, you have a complete freedom of choice of the direction of the branch cut. You can choose any other direction, say along the imaginary axis or along the real positive semi-axis. If you draw a branch cut along the real positive semi-axis, quite often you need exactly that kind of branch cut. Then, Strictly positive numbers are forbidden, they are inaccessible. But the square root function is perfectly well defined on the upper or lower banks of a branch cut. Suppose we decide that our square root function assumes the arithmetic values on the upper bank of the branch cut. So we denote it as f of x plus i0 is equal to the square root of x for positive x. Then on the lower bank, at almost the same point, f of x minus i0 is equal to the square root of x times e to 2 pi i, which yields square root of x with negative sign. Here, let's elaborate a little bit further. We've just decided that our square root function assumes the arithmetic value on the upper bank of the branch cut. Now, by drawing different contours from the upper bank of the branch cut into all the possible points in the complex plane, we determine a unique value for our square root function in any point. This way, we build a fully single-valued function in the entire complex plane. And this way, the initially double-valued square root function becomes single-valued in the complex plane. We reduced the sets of its numbers by half. And this portion of the square root function 
has a special name in complex analysis. It's called a regular branch of the square root. Or we could use another definition. We could say that our square root function assumes negative values on the upper bank of the branch card. So f of x plus i0 is equal to negative square root of x for positive x. Then, by connecting the upper bank of the branch card with the rest of the points in the complex plane by some contours, and making analytic continuation along these contours, we also build a single valued function. But it will be a different function. At each point, its value will differ in sign from the previous function. And they say we determine a second regular branch of the square root. You see that on the upper and lower bank of the branch card, the value of the function undergoes a jump. Its value changes instantly from negative to positive 1. That is another reason why we need a branch card. So let us summarize what we've just learned on this first slide. First, after analytically continuing the square root function along the curve in the complex plane, we realized that even this simplest function can't be made single-valued in the entire complex plane. It inevitably starts branching. And this was due to the reason that this complex number under the square root underwent a full rotation. Second, we came to the conclusion that this problem can be solved in a rather radical fashion by cutting a complex plane. And this is how we introduced the concept of a branch cut. In our future lectures, we will be dealing with way more interesting functions and uh, much less trivial branch cuts. So I hope you enjoyed this first part and stay tuned.